So we've got Jimmy and Sharon, and they're both retired, right? They're going to take Social Security at 62. Now, what we can gleam from the article here is that Jimmy's going to get Social Security of 2035, okay? So we're going to take Social Security at 62 of 2035. Now, keep in mind, if you were to claim Social Security at 62 like Jimmy's going to do, you're going to get 70% of your full retirement benefit. If you wait till 67, you're going to get 100% of your full retirement benefit. And if you wait till 70, if you're an overachiever, a broccoli eater, if you like your veggies, you're going to get 124% of your full retirement benefit. And your Social Security decision is based on your personal situation. It's not something where you can just read an article and it says, hey, take Social Security at 67, 7. That makes the most sense. It's got to be based on what you're trying to accomplish. So we want to look at that for Jimmy and Sharon. We also want to look at it from a tax standpoint, because how you are taxed is how your Social Security is taxed. And they've got two types of money, IRA and certificates of deposit. And we need to see how all that works together when it comes to their taxes and their retirement income. All right. So Sharon, he said, has has Social Security a way less. Well, I don't know what way less is from a money standpoint. So what we're going to do is we're going to give Sharon a spousal Social Security benefit. We're going to assume Sharon maybe raised the kids. She was a homemaker so that there's not a lot of working record. So she's going to get $651 in Social Security at 62. Now, because Jimmy is claiming Social Security benefits at 62, Sharon can claim a spousal benefit up to 32% of his benefit, of the higher Social Security benefit at 62. If Jimmy were to wait till 67 to claim Social Security and Sharon waited to take spousal benefits at 67, she would get up to 50% of the Social Security benefit, okay? So that's why it's important to understand the retirement income plan. We wanna know, is taking Social Security at 62, is that gonna be the most efficient for me, for my wife, for our entire family. And so we're going to look at maybe killing Jimmy off and saying, did it make sense to take Social Security so early? Okay. So from an asset standpoint, here's what we've got. We've got money in a CD of $200,000 and we have an IRA of $350,000. Now I know there's multiple IRAs in this scenario. We just combine them into one because they're all taxed exactly the same. Now we have a home and we're going to put the value of that home at $600,000. Now, I'm not just pulling that out of air. If you go back to the article, it says actually the value of your home, you don't say, but the median value of a home in Massachusetts is about $600,000. So we're going to use $600,000 as the value for the home. Now, it could be less, could be more. We don't know. So we just have to put something in there. Now, from a rate of return standpoint, we're going to look at a lower rate of return. We're going to look at 4%. And the reason I want to look at 4% on their money is because the market's averaged 8% over the last 50 years with inflation. That's the S&P 500. So if we are going into retirement, we don't want to have the same amount of risk as the overall stock market. So we're going to go about 4% behind that, and we're going to go to 4%. And we're going to use 2% for our CDs. Now, the reason I'm going to use 2%, you might be saying, hey, Drew, I can get 4 or 5% right now on a CD. That, that's true currently, but I don't know what the long-term average is going to be on that. And I would guess it's going to be somewhere between 2 and 3%. So we're going to use 2% on the money in the bank. Now, the question becomes... We've got this money in the bank. We have this money in the IRAs. Does it make sense or would it make sense for Jimmy and Sharon Frugal to take some of this money to put it down here, not in the IRA, but in the market to earn a little bit more interest, maybe in corporate bonds or treasuries or dividend paying stocks, something like that? I don't know. We haven't got there yet. So we just want to see if the math holds up and then we can start making some, you know, some assumptions on or recommendations based on that. Okay. So let's go to expenses. Now, they have really low expenses, especially for someone who lives in Massachusetts. $2,700 is their monthly expenses. So you can see that baseline expenses of $2,700. We're going to use 3.27% as our inflation rate. And this is going to go for per in perpetuity. So this is going to be $2,700 with 3.27% monthly inflation. or we It's annualized inflation divided by 12. We're going to do that forever. Okay. Now, from a tax standpoint, let's go to the year 2024. From a tax standpoint, we're looking at a 0% tax bracket. 
And you might be thinking, oh, Drew, why, why are they at a 0% tax bracket? We had a projected Massachusetts rate of 5%. They're not paying 5% because their their federal rate's at zero. Well, it all it's the withdrawal order. It's the withdrawal order on the money. If you see, the withdrawal order is the bank first, the IRA second. So the question becomes, because they've got, we're using the bank to do withdrawals first, and we're in a low tax bracket, would it make sense to do some Roth conversions on this money to push some of this to tax free? Because you, you and I know what's coming, right? At 73, Jimmy and Sharon are going to have to start taking a required minimum distribution off their IRAs. It starts at 3.65% and it goes up from there. When you're in your 80s, it's 6 and 7% that you are required to remove from your IRA, pay taxes on that. And depending on the type of market that we're in, up or down, can determine if that's an appreciating asset or a depreciating asset when you're pulling that money out. So we're going to use the bank account money first. The IRA last, can we do Roth conversions on this to push tax-free money later down the road in retirement? That's something to really think about and consider, and that's something that we will look at before this video is through. Now, if we go to retirement, this is when the rubber meets the road. Can they retire at 61? We've got $550,000. Here's our house of $600,000. We're 61 years old. We're going to take Social Security at 62 of 2686. That's both of them. Our net monthly income, that's after taxes, is 2686. 2862 is what our new monthly expenses are, right? You guys see this? Here's our monthly expenses going up with inflation. This red line means just what we have to withdraw from our portfolios, which is not a whole lot, 1,000, 2080, which is pretty good which means here we go. Here's our money and it actually continues to grow. You see that money growing? And we get to, what is this, 100? We've got a million dollars. It's a pretty good scenario, right? 4%, very low uh, expenses. But here's the thing that I want to make sure we understand. And this is why you want to work with a financial advisor. M maybe the Reddit community is pointing this out, but this is something you want to think about. Let's go to long-term care first. And I want to talk about long-term care because we're going to talk about death here in a second and losing a spouse. But long-term care is probably the most expensive cost you will have in retirement. And when I mean long-term care, I'm not talking about nursing home. In, in this case, we're going to look at that. But I'm talking about assisted living, chronic care, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. That is cognitive disease is on the rise. And so the cost of maintaining a spouse or a child maintaining a parent in the house is very expensive. And we need a plan for that. So let's look at Jimmy and Sharon. And so Jimmy's 61 years old and the current cost of long-term care in Massachusetts is 12167 now, when Jimmy's 80 in the year 2042, using inflation, the future monthly cost would be $22,066. We're looking at a cost increase of 3.07% per year. Let's say we need four years of care. What's that going to do to Sharon? So at 80, here we go. We need care. Boom, 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 boom. We're out of money at 83 years old. So that plan that looked really good beforehand it really gets smacked in the face. Now, let's assume that Jimmy only needs two years of care because most people in long-term care will only spend about 18 months, okay? So let's say it's two years. Now let's go back to this. Here's our two years of care and Sharon's running low on money at 92 years old. Essentially, after Jimmy gets out, you know, after Jimmy passes away and goes home, we've got $381,000 in spendable assets, all right? And, and what the program is doing too, which we've got to really think about adjusting, we still have Social Security here, right? And so we have, it, it adjusts down, we lose, we lose Sharon's Social Security because she's the lesser of the two. We have Jimmy's, We've got 314,000 assets. We have this house right here. So, it, you know, and I, again, I don't know what the value of the home is just using the Market Watch article. But when I see this, healthcare is something they've really got to start thinking about, right? And that's only two years of care. And so we need to really have a plan for our long term care, for our assisted living. Can I retire at 61 with $550,000? Yeah, you can, but we need to be thinking about long-term care. We need to be thinking about assisted living. We need to be thinking about home health care. Those are two major things we need to think about.
Now, let's look at their expenses. So right now, their expenses are $2,700. But what if they're underestimating their expenses? Now, the average retirement expenses in America today is about $50,000. Okay, now that's probably with a mortgage, so they don't have a mortgage. So let's say they need $45,000 in income. So they've overestimated and maybe not even 45. How about we use $40,000? That's a that's a good number. So that would be $3,333. So about an extra 600 bucks. So if we add an extra $600 in here for baseline, let's just say Jimmy and Sharon Frugal aren't as frugal as they think they are or they just can't maintain normal everyday expenses in Massachusetts on $2,700 a month, or maybe they actually want to have some fun in retirement and we need to spend a little extra money, right? I mean, goodness gracious, you've worked so hard and saved and paid off your house. Why don't you do something with the money? So let's look at a retirement now. We've increased our monthly expenses, which means we've increased the money that's coming out of our portfolio. We go to retirement and look at this at a hundred, we've got 148,956. Do you guys see the difference in that? Let me go back and let me show you. So let's put 2700 in here. That's what their, their original expenses were. We go to retirement, a million dollars. So remember that, a million dollars. Now we add in just $600 more a month. We go to 3300 with inflation, remember, go to retirement, 199554 See that? That's a big difference. There's a big difference there just by adding a little extra income. And so that's something we got to be thinking about. We've got to be thinking about what happens if our expenses increase. Going back to the healthcare, what if we have a chronic disease? We have a medication that we need that's more expensive. What if we have a certain type of rehab or care that we need and it's a constant care or just expenses continue to rise? What are we going to do? We've got to be thinking about all aspects of our retirement plan, especially if we're going to retire at 61 with $550,000. Am I saying they can't do it? No, I am not saying they can't do it. What I'm saying is as your financial doctor, there are things that we have to be aware of. We have to think about when you go into your doctor and you do blood work. Let's say you have high cholesterol. Your doctor's not going to look at you and say, hey, you've got high cholesterol. You're looking great. Good luck. Have a wonderful life. No, he's probably going to say, hey, Jimmy. Hey, Sharon. You got high cholesterol. This is something we need to talk about. All your other vitals look really good, but this cholesterol thing is something we need to have a discussion over. Now, I'm not a medical expert. Maybe cholesterol is not that big of a deal, but your doctor's not going to let you just say, hey, hopefully everything's good. That's the same thing we're trying to do here as a fiduciary, as an advisor. I want to look at the entire plan and say, hey, let's poke some holes in this because we need to know that things happen in life. I've been doing this long enough to know that things happen. All right. So let's take their expenses back down to 2700 And here's what I want to do. I want to show you Jimmy passing away because we're going to lose Sharon's Social Security. And let's say that Jimmy passes away at 80 so we're going to say Jimmy, well, actually, we're going to make this Sharon. Boop. So Jimmy's going to pass away at 80, okay? So that means that Sharon is going to have to take his Social Security at 80 years old. So we're going to take hers from 62 to 80 because they're the same age. And at 80 and one month, she's going to start taking his Social Security benefit whatever that would have been at 80. So we're given COLA of 2.58% on Social Security. That means the Social Security benefits growing at 2.58%. So 2035, let's just do it on the old calculator. That makes it easy. 2.58%. Let's look at this for 18 years. 3,218 is what this, her Social Security would benefit would be. Did you, did you see what I did there? Right now at 62, Jimmy gets 2035 in Social Security. Sharon gets 651. When Jimmy dies, Sharon gets his Social Security and she loses hers. But now between now and 80, the 2035 has a 2.58% COLA increase on it. So what Sharon's going to get at 80 is 3,218 
which is Jimmy's benefit with a COLA increase. Okay. So now let's go to retirement. So we went from a million dollars. Remember, we had a million dollars. Now we have 599412 But let's start adding in some things. Let's add in some long-term care. We'll go to Sharon. Now let's say Sharon needs long-term care at 83. Okay. And where are we at now? 83 years old. We're out of money at 85. So you see how there's multiple factors that you need to be considering when we're thinking about these plans? It's not just, hey, do I have enough? Is this going to last forever? I mean, the questions that we want to answer with your financial EKG are, can I retire and how long is my money going to last? We need to answer that, but we also need to add in some of these external factors while we're trying to answer those questions. Now, let's look at a couple more factors before we get off this video. Let's go back to income. Let's bring Jimmy back to life. So we're going to say Jimmy's going to live forever. All right. We're all going to live forever somewhere. That's your choice. But let's uh, let's bring Jimmy back from the dead. Let's Lazarus Jimmy here. We'll bring him back from the dead. And I want to look at market returns. Because right now we're running at 4%. But what I need to do, and remember, they've only got 63% of their money at risk, right? The rest of their money, this, this green money, this is low risk. It's in the bank. You can't lose money in the bank. I mean, you could lose money in the bank by like inflation, but the odds of you losing money in the bank in the sense of the money going bankrupt or the bank going bankrupt or a bank run or something like the Great Depression, odds are very, very low. But you can lose money in the bank if inflation's running faster. It's called purchasing power than the money's earning in the bank. But we're going to look at the market money first, okay? So our rate of return is very low. It's about 4%. It's what we're running on the money in the market. What we want to do is we want to look at some Monte Carlo analysis. And basically what Monte Carlo is is saying, well, what happens if the market kind of stinks? Now, in this scenario, this looks really, really bad. We got three bad years, four good years, one, two, three, four, five bad years. This is a bad scenario. And you can see how we run this all the way out till they're 100 just to see what's going to happen. So if we go down here and we look at it, you know, actually, even in this really bad year, they're not too bad. Not too bad at all. Now, keep in mind, we're not including long-term care in this. We're not including added expenses. We're just looking at the base case, $2,700. So we're stress testing this. We're trying to run this through a meat grinder. Not to say, I'm not trying to find something wrong with this plan. I'm trying to make sure, it's just like when you go to the doctor, he throws you on the treadmill. He's not trying to find something wrong with you. The goal of your doctor is for you to come off that treadmill and he'd be like, high five, like, dude, you are in great shape. Your heart's awesome. Your lungs are great. Your blood work looks great. I don't want to see you for another year. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to say, hey, this looks great, but we also have to run the test. So let's generate another one. Okay. I don't think we changed much there. Let's generate another one. No, we're not generating anything. We are not changing. Generate. All right. Well, now the Monte Carlo scenario is not generating anymore. So let's let's go to market. Let's go to historical rates real quick. So historical rates, we're able to say, OK, what would happen if you were to retire in the year 2000? Like what would happen to your portfolio? And I would say probably that's like the worst case scenario. So if we look at this, if they were to retire in the year 2000, again, at 100, they got five hundred and ten thousand dollars. It's a pretty good scenario. Again, I'm not down on their scenario. Let's go to 1968. That's the last time we had the kind of inflation we're having right now between 68 and 82. Now we look at it, 644,000. So again, we're running this conservatively enough that even in bad historical markets, they're doing really well. Okay, I promised you one more thing. Let's look at taxes. Now, right now, their tax rate's at zero. The reason, again, we, we talked about this a little bit, the withdrawal order, we're using this bank money first. Bank money doesn't have taxes on it. But this right here, churning in the background, this 351.167, it's going to have some taxes on it one day. So we need to do something about that. So what we're going to do, and we've already prepared this, we're going to look at a tax tracker optimization. So what we're going to look at is doing some Roth conversions. And I'll show you what, what we're going to do. You see this transfer over here? We're going to do some IRA transfers, and these are Roth conversions. Now, we're just going to do a blanket Roth conversion. Obviously, we're going to have to adjust this every year because in the year 2026, taxes are going to go up. 
So we might not be able to do this Roth conversion or this Roth conversion. That's something that we have to look at our quarterly reviews on to make sure we're moving in the right direction, all right? So let's look at their taxes. Now, 2024, we've done the Roth conversion. Look at this, our projected federal tax rate is still zero. Drew, why is that? Why is it zero? Well, let me tell you. We're using this bucket of money for income. We're doing Roth conversions on this money. But we're also using this money to pay the taxes. But remember, our tax rate's at zero. So we're essentially being able to sock away a bunch of this Roth IRA money tax-free. There's our standard deduction, and we're doing it at zero. We go to retirement. At 100, we got $1.1 million saved for retirement. The big thing I want to look at is at 80, look at this. We've got $81,000 in forced required minimum distributions, 202 in the bank. Our IRA is at 438, and we've got a Roth conversion account of 191. So we have $191,000 now of tax-free retirement investing accounts, which we didn't have before. So we weren't able to get all of it done. We probably could get all of it done if we extended the program. Again, I'm a little hesitant with the year 2026 on saying, hey, this is something we're going to be able to extend you know, into 2030 or whatever, but we're on the right track. And if you look at the comparison here, current scenario this is the Roth conversion scenario. At 100, we've got 1 million 20, right? You see that? There's the RMDs, which is, you know, been taxed money. There's our bank money. There's our IRA. Here's our Roth conversion. There's our forced RMDs. There's our bank. There's our IRA. There's our Roth conversion. Now, if Jimmy and Sharon had kids, what kind of money do you want your kids to inherit? You want them to inherit Roth money? bank money and this forced RMD, which we just basically put in 1090, it's called 1099 interest. We just put in a checking account. This right here, this 152203 has got to follow the new 10-year structure. So when your kids inherit it, they got to have that thing like drained in 10 years. Now, I know my kids and I know kids that I work with, um, they probably pulling up in a Lamborghini saying, where my 152,000? I want my land, I want to pay for this Lambo. But when we're thinking about legacy, this Roth conversion, it's got to be out in 10 years as well but it's tax-free. So now they're pulling up in two Lamborghinis, right? They, I got two Lambos, maybe a G-Wagon from Mercedes or something, okay? Now, another big number to think about too is lifetime taxation. The lifetime taxation for Jimmy and Sharon Frugal, 278 in the current scenario. That means retiring at 61, dying at 100. How much in taxes are they going to pay? Approximately 278 versus 183 doing the Roth conversion. So we're doing Roth conversions and we're still paying less taxes over time. Again, that's what we want to look at. A financial EKG is what we want to do if you're thinking, hey, can I retire at 61 with $550,000? We want to make sure that we can get you to retirement, through retirement, and protect your ability to stay in retirement. Thank you so much for watching, and I have enjoyed being with you today. God bless you.